Renee from the Pierce Conservation District. And if you're not familiar with what districts are and how we started, we were established after the Dust Bowl to prevent man-made agricultural natural disasters from occurring. So, you know, the soil was left bare and it blew away and we definitely want to prevent that. And there's pretty much a district in every county in the U.S. And we focus on our natural resource concerns. So in Pierce County here, it's all about water quality, keeping the water clean, keeping the soil and, and nutrients out of the water. So a lot of the things that we recommend have that in mind, but it also has the added benefits of how to have more grass, less mud, you know, what to do with your manure so you don't have a giant manure pile on your, on your livestock operation. So one of the other things we really recommend is not disturbing the ground as much as possible. So a couple years ago, we purchased a no-till seed drill and we loan that out to producers. They just have to pay for its transportation. And it's a way to put seed in the ground where you want it, at the depth you want it. So just briefly, the main benefits of using a no-till drill definitely going to save on fuel because you're not having to work the ground and then come back and roll it and then do your seeding. Um, this is a one pass operation really. So obviously you're going to save a lot of time. Um, carbon sequestration is another benefit because when you turn over the soil, the carbon is released into the atmosphere. So it's keeping it in the ground. And it's very important out here as Don can tell you in a little bit, you're not going to bring up rocks because you're not plowing and disking, which I don't even know if that would be possible out here with all the rocks that he has. Um, definitely won't be wasting seed because you're, you're putting it at the depth you want. You're not just broadcasting it for the birds to eat. Um, so your pastures can be grazed sooner after you're doing a, a renovation with the seed drill because Generally, if you completely work the ground and the seed comes up, you have to be very cautious that the, the roots are established enough that the, the animals aren't just going to pull, pull them out of the ground. And the way you do that is through the pull test. You can pull it out of the ground and your animals are going to be able to do that. So usually what we recommend is if that's happening, um, you test it. You go out and mow it, that's going to get the roots going down further and then you do the pull test again. But if you're seeding into an established pasture, usually you can get out there earlier because when they're biting the grass, they're not just going to be biting that one plant that was seeded, they're going to be biting another established plant next to it. So less likely that they're going to pull things out of the ground. Um, you know, like I said, other than carbon being released into the atmosphere, tillage is detrimental to the soil structure. It breaks up that soil structure, so it affects the water holding capacity and uh, definitely makes the soil more likely to erode if, if you're not doing the right practices to when you're doing your renovation. And also tillage is disrupt disruptive to soil microorganisms their habitat gets disturbed because they have that symbiotic relationship with the roots in the soil. Those get broken up with tillage. And then tillage also results in a breakdown of organic matter. So you're, you're losing that and that, that holds a lot of, of moisture in the soil. And, and when you're tilling, you're bringing up weed seeds. So you're more likely to, to have seeds grow weeds growing out there with your grasses. So definitely uh, using no-till or reduced till, till can be a tool for in increasing the capacity of the soil to function optimally and reduce the need for tillage. So healthy soils are going to allow water to infiltrate, retain and cycle nutrients and carbon, regenerate pest and disease population, and then also save you time and money. So that's why we recommend it. And then Don is going to tell you what he's done on the property here that he leases, kind of his 
his uh, the way he came about he was one of the people that was really encouraging us to buy a no-till drill several years ago well thank you renee and thank you to uh, pierce county conservation district for holding this workshop this morning on a beautiful day by the way uh it's a perfect day for us to kind of learn a little bit about our own experiences and i think that's really the best way to really inform ourselves um what I thought I would do is maybe talk about my role here and my goal on this particular uh, farm. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my production, what's happened on my production side of the, of the farm. A little bit about the services I've used to hopefully improve yields, because that's really, for me, it was all about yields. Um, and converting a pasture basically into a hay, hay ground is, is something else. Um, and then to talk about my experience with a no-till cedar, because uh, Renate gave you, I think, a good example of how valuable the cedar is to, I think, all of us that use it. But I will tell you, it was a game changer for me. And it just made everything very different. It solved a huge problem uh, for us. So on the first item, my role and my goal for this farm, the actual owner, uh, it was interesting. About 15 years ago, <clears throat> their goal, they called me up and said, can you do some fire cuts? Because we had a prairie fire out here. And by the way, just so you know, you see those trees way over there with the house over there? That's where I live. So I was very interested in trying to control the fire threat. Because <laughs> yeah, nobody, cattle had been on here, uh, her father had passed away, and she wasn't interested in uh, raising cattle anymore. And so uh, I said, okay, I'll come over here and I'll cut with my uh, brush hog a few you know fire lanes and whatnot after after we'd had a, this fire um, and because uh, there's a barn way down there you can barely see it but nonetheless <laughs> i got over here and i said oh my god why am i cutting fire lane why why isn't somebody using this property in a more productive way because it's a beautiful uh, piece so her expectation that the owner is really fire uh, management so that it doesn't burn the place down uh, in terms of the old barn. My goal was and has been is, well, can we improve the yields on this and, and make it useful to, for me to basically maintain the fire threat by cutting it every year. So those are kind of the goals. Uh, and, and my role really over the years has been as a lessee um, just to enjoy it. Because uh, I, I, I was born and raised on a farm in South Dakota. So I've got, to, you know, some of us are kind of crazy that way. I don't know why it is, but we just love the land. And that's kind of where I come from. And I wanted to improve it. On the production side, I was looking at my numbers. And uh, I don't, I didn't keep very good records when I first started. And by the way, switching over to actual production of hay, even though I've been involved for about 15 years, first five years I didn't really do much um, and uh, I decided about maybe 10 seven years ago somewhere in that range I said well I got to get serious about doing something here because I saw a huge opportunity and, and by the way what you see here is just imagine uh, pretty much what you see here along this uh, side of the road was pretty much what you saw here through this except the blackberry and you know, in all the other weeds that you can possibly imagine. So I cleared it all up, it took me about two, three years. And then I had a problem with rocks because uh, it's very rocky soil here. So I spent about a year uh, picking up rocks. And last year was the best year I had. We, had, we got a little over 5,000 bales off this property. And uh, that was the highlight. And I think everybody pretty well had a great year on hay. I mean, it was exceptional and had not, I trace it to the water and the amount of water and the rain that we got that was phenomenal but that was the biggest year normally uh what i've been getting off of this property is somewhere between uh, 2500 and 3500 bales they're small bales 55 pounds so uh that's pretty much what we're doing is a local hay for horses so you you said you didn't keep good records but can you remember, you know, how much your production has increased since you've started? Well, since I, well, the, the part of the issue I have, and uh, 
what uh, Rene, the reason I have a, a di real difficult time is, is this big field, when I first started, I didn't do anything to it. I just cut fire. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say for, on a comparable basis, um, I think my production has increased with the seeding, which I'll talk a little bit more about because I think that's probably some of your biggest interest. Mm -hmm. With the seeding, I'd say I've improved it on the on the basis of uh, I'd say probably 25 to 30 percent on my yield. Comparable acreage is comparable acreage. Mm -hmm. uh, soil tests. I really highly recommend that uh, for you. for a couple of years when I was starting out. I didn't do any soil tests, and I was talking to the guy, the guy I work with, and well, we'll we'll just get this, you know, nitrogen, yeah, you know, make, green it up. And anyway, uh, soil tests are really critical. I do them every year, um, but testing is really important. When do you do your testing in the fall? Or? Oh, I I, do, I usually do my testing in the winter time. Usually, isn't that one? Yeah, normally? I mean, um, you can probably do it any time after. Yeah, after it's harvest. good to do it once you start doing it. Do it at the same time of year every time. So I try to do it in January because I'm fertilizing probably in March. So I do it in January. So, uh, well, you're going to be going, your next workshop is with the no-till cedar in the demonstration. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. I've already indicated it was a game changer for us it, because it solved a huge problem. And my theory was when I looked at the soil and the amount of rocks and the poor nature of it, the no-till sill cedar was just a, a godsend for us because it allowed me to change what it is that you're looking at here today. Um, I seed in the spring and the fall. Uh, one of the best results I had though was uh, recently was in the spring, but you can do it either way. I, I don't, uh, I think I, I've, I think I used this in the fall. I After you so. first got it, it was yeah. in the fall. Yeah. So I would recommend you kind of pick and choose and just do it. Um, you're doing it every year? consistently? Or no, I haven't done it. I didn't do it uh, last fall or this spring. I am going to do it this fall because um, there's some spots here which gets me to, if there isn't anything that you want to be very careful of besides the rate of seed, the depth of the seed. Because I will suggest to you a mistake I made is I thought I had it right but you will see there's a lot of dips and mounds and I mean and my theory now that I'm, I'm using and in fact the last field I used it on I set it to where it was about a quarter of an inch into the soil and um, that's the best way because I was too deep and yeah. if you get it too deep and you're in a no-till situation you will not see the seed yeah. it will not come up mm -hmm. it just it just you're just wasting your time in fact, I'm, I'm convinced now, you're better off even that, where you've got dips and stuff like that. Let the seed get on top of it, it rather than getting it too deep. At least you've got a chance to germinate. Yeah, I, I used the drill twice at my house. Yeah. And I followed the directions, set it how it's supposed to be the first time. I hardly saw anything. So I, I erred on the side of more shallow than the... The recommendation and I did it again this last fall and it I mean you can see stripes out there of, of the grass it made a huge difference I think and uh, what we're standing in here in this field is is a field that I reseeded it was one of the first fields that I, uh, I reseeded it with uh, orchard as well as rye and I would say that the orchard took a lot better than the rye for whatever reason. I also can suggest to you that this is the field where I think I lost probably three-fourths of my seed because I was too deep and it was really frustrating. You can see kind of how blotchy this is and part of it I think is because I was too deep but this is probably a good example of how I change the yields that I'm getting off of these fields. Because uh, this will uh, this will be uh, probably one of my better fields. And particularly as you go over the hill here, you'll see, uh, and of course, obviously, the soil conditions change as we get closer. That's a creek, um, Muck Creek. 
and uh, the soil condition changes. And as that changes, the yields change. Uh, but again, I thought for purposes of seeing and showing you kind of the changes that have occurred. Prior to my uh, planning here, this was basically a prairie fescue, very, very short, very short. Uh, and um, so, but that's the, that's the change, uh, that's the yield change that I've been getting. And uh, I'm still not done because I think that uh, these fields can do better if I can get a combination of manure and Someday, if I can afford the lime, maybe. Right. <laughs> but I don't think that's in the near future because it's so expensive for yeah. me. Yeah. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is that the how lime is really beneficial is so you know with all the rain we get, the bases and the soils get washed out. So over time, your your soil gets more acidic. But the more productive grasses, like this prairie grass that Don's talking about. It can survive, you know, a nuclear blast, basically. You know, it's going to live on nothing. But the more productive grasses really need to live in a neutral pH, and they can't physically take up as many nutrients if they're in acidic soil. So you might be putting nutrients out here, but they aren't utilizing all of them. So really, if you can, you know, if you want to know where to start or if you can only afford one or the other, I'd always recommend liming first because then, you know, they can take advantage of the nutrients that are already in the soil and, and that sort of thing. Is there anything that works as lime that's cheaper? Like, <laughs> can I put a bunch of chickens on my... Well, I, I went the cheap route when we bought our property. So, you know, you want to use like ag lime, that sort of thing, but we use hydrated lime which is like the cheapest, but also the nastiest thing. You know, you don't want to get it on your skin. You can't let your animals out there until it's washed in. Our dog followed us around when we were liming, didn't even think about it, burned his feet. Oh, yeah, so it's nasty stuff, but it is probably a third of the price. So, but it, I would definitely put it out in the fall and keep your animals off of it until it really gets washed in, washed off the grass. The other thing that's interesting is, is you can actually see the drill line here if you look closely, uh, how it took. Uh, you can see the, the straight line. <laughs> it, it, it tells you the, the changes that's, that's occurring. And uh, yeah, I just wish I would have been a little bit smarter when we first started out. Well, one but, thing too, um, I used to be skeptical of this. You know, you read that some plants, especially like tall fescue, take a while to establish. Uh -huh. And they really do like take two years to really come on because I I seeded two years ago and like this didn't come on that well and really now this spring I'm seeing the the, the plants that I seeded two years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my hope. I guess that's uh, I, I'm hoping that that'll occur. But but also though the the mere fact that I've learned a lot and uh, I I plan on reseeding some of this uh, this fall. When did you uh, do this one? Oh, this one was probably about, uh, this one had to have been three years ago. When did you get the cedar? I think you're right. I think three it was 2018, yeah. maybe early yeah. 2019. Yeah. Is there a better time to seed, or can you really just seed any time since it's a seed drill? Well, two things on that is, first of all, because this is a hay field, you're either going to be doing it in the fall, right. or you're going to be doing it in the spring. Right. And those two time periods of time, you got plenty of moisture usually occurring. And so those are the two times because at any other time it, you wouldn't want to be doing it now. Right. You know, I, yeah, I, I don't want to do it now. Right. It's yeah. too late. It usually, the, we've got a reference in the, the packet you guys are going to get. WSU Extension has a really good renovation guide. It talks about you know no-till or traditional or you know using livestock, whatever. And their rule of thumb is um, not after May first. And I've found in the fall, you know, they say it could be any time, you know, August, September. But I think with a no-till drill, you're you're also, you know, the seeds you're putting out there are, are competing against what's already there. Or actually, it's really vice versa. What's already there is going to outcompete your new little seedlings. So at my place, I really timed it well. I think this year I did it right around Labor Day weekend when everything else was stressed and 
you know, kind of the low point before we started to get rain and it started to take off again. I, it really allowed the new stuff to really come on before the, the existing grass started to regrow with the rain. So, I mean, I could really see the stripes of green of the new stuff was actually taller than the, the existing grass. And then, would you do a lime application at the same time that you're seeding? Or would yeah, you, you, could, you, you could, could time that. Yeah, you just, you don't want to time your liming and, and any nitrogen application at the same time because if you put on lime and then nitrogen too soon, it'll volatilize the nitrogen into the air, so more climate change. <laughs> so you definitely want to time those at least a week apart. So put on your nitrogen, wait a week, put on your lime, that sort of thing. So in relation to when you seed, it doesn't necessarily matter. No. Is there anything that works as lime that's cheaper? <laughs> like, can I put a bunch of chickens on my... Well, I, I went the cheap route when we bought our property. So, you know, you want to use like ag lime, that sort of thing, but we use hydrated lime, which is like the cheapest, but also the nastiest thing. You know, you don't want to get it on your skin. You can't let your animals out there until it's washed in. Our dog followed us around when we were liming, didn't even think about it, burned his feet. Yeah, so it's nasty stuff, but it is probably a third of the price. So, but it, I would definitely put it out in the fall and, Keep your animals off of it until it really gets washed in, washed off the grass. The other thing that's interesting is, is you can actually see the drill line here if you look closely, uh, how it took. Uh, you can see the, the straight line. It, it, it tells you the, the changes that's, that's occurring. And uh, yeah, I just wish I would have been a little bit smarter when we first started out. Well, one but, thing too, um, I used to be skeptical of this, you know, you read that some plants, especially like tall fescue, take a while to establish, uh -huh. and they really do like take two years to really come on, because I, I seeded two years ago and like, this didn't come on that well, and really now, this spring, I'm seeing the, the, the plants that I seeded two years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my hope. I guess that's, uh, I, I'm hoping that that'll occur, but, but also the, the, the mere fact that I've learned a lot and uh, I, I plan on reseeding some of this uh, this fall. When did you uh, do this one? Oh, this one was probably about, uh, this one had to been three years ago. When did you get the cedar? I think you're right. I think three it was 2018, yeah. maybe early yeah. 2019. Yeah. Is there a better time to seed or can you really just seed any time since it's a seed drill? Well, two things on that is first of all because this is a hay field you're either going to be doing it in the fall right. or you're going to be doing it in the spring right. and those two time periods of time you got plenty of moisture usually occurring and so those are the two times because at any other time it, you wouldn't want to be doing it now right. you know I, yeah, I, I don't want to do it now right. it's yeah. too late and usually the, we've got a reference in the, the packet you guys are going to get WSU Extension has a really good renovation guide. It talks about, you know, no-till or traditional or, you know, using livestock, whatever. And their rule of thumb is um, not after May 1st. And I've found in the fall, you know, they say could be any time, you know, August, September. But I think with a no-till drill, you're, you're also, you know, the seeds you're putting out there are, are competing against what's already there, or actually it's really vice versa. What's already there is going to outcompete your new little seedlings. So at my place, I really timed it well. I think this year I did it right around Labor Day weekend when everything else was stressed and, you know, kind of the low point before we started to get rain and it started to take off again. I, it really allowed the new stuff to really come on before the, the existing grass started to regrow with the rain. So I mean, I could really see the stripes of green of the new stuff was actually taller than the, the existing grass. And then would you do a lime application at the same time that you're seeding? Or would yeah, you, you could, you you could, could time that, yeah, you just, you don't want to time your liming and, and any nitrogen application at the same time because if you put on lime and then nitrogen too soon, 
it'll volatilize the nitrogen into the air, so more climate change. <laughs> so you definitely want to time those at least a week apart. So put on your nitrogen, wait a week, put on your lime, that sort of thing. So in relation to when you seed, it doesn't necessarily matter? No. So. Okay, so we're rephasing the drill cylinders by lifting to the maximum height and then hold for 10 seconds. Remove transport locks. Note the upside down position of the locks. Remember to put the locks back on in this orientation to avoid damage to the cylinder stops. These are the transport locks. That's just for towing. Yeah, it. when you're towing it, so that. Okay. So then it's lower the drill completely. Okay. So when you when you schedule this with Jennings, they'll ask you how tall your draw bar height is because the measurement between the ground and the bottom of the frame tube should be 24 and 3 quarter inches. <laughs> so and that is key. Now this frame here so it should be 24 and 3 quarter inches. And if it's not, you got to come to this side. We had a monkey around with us at our place. Okay, so this is the cylinder stop plate. Yeah. And this is really what's going to direct how that's deep what, it fits. Was it Bob, the first guy? Uh, Don. Don. Yeah, he said so that, that's the key mechanism. And this height adjustment, you just loosen up these half inches and yep. half Yep, we did have a tool in there. Hmm. I don't know if I there anymore, but that's how you do it. You got to readjust this guy. Hmm. So what you want is, see how it, this is the stop? Yeah. It should be right there. And this is 24 and 3 quarters. Are we measuring this or we're not going to do it? No, I mean, Jennings will set it up for you when they come out. They'll have it adjusted already for, mm -hmm. for the height of your draw bar. So if, if you just give them the measurement from the ground to the bottom of your draw bar, they'll, they'll, they'll set, set it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they drop it off, it should be ready to go. So then you need to check that it's running at level so the, the tongue and the seed box should be level. I'm just going to eyeball yeah, it for yeah. demonstration purposes. Uh, drill will come and just and run on level by submitting a tractor draw bar height. Okay, and then adjust the seed box level using the turn buckle to level the seed box separate from the tongue. And I never had to do that because it was always already it's level. Set. I don't yeah, know if you had to do that. No, we didn't. This is the turn buckle here. Mm -hmm. And we've got, in case you don't so if it was have your all thing, the, here's all the instructions in here. Uh, and the toolbox has some different adapters. Okay, adjust the double disc openers so your seed is placed at the proper depth. This is done via the T-handles on the press wheel. So this is going to be really the, what I think is the most critical part. It's these handles here. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's one on each um, on each drill section and every one of those is a quarter inch. Yep. Mm. So all the way forward is the shallowest position, all the way back is the deepest. So that, this is the shallowest position. Yep. It's yep. quarter inch, half. That would be a zero. Yeah, well, each, that's zero. Yep, oh. the first one's zero. Okay. So and then the next one back would be a quarter. quarter. Yeah, mm -hmm. each increment will adjust the depth by about a quarter inch, or walking the handle side to side will adjust the depth by about an eighth of an inch. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Yep. See how it's. Yeah. So then, set the initial seed rate handle. Set the main box seed rate handle to the setting corresponding to your desired rate. So in this one, we're doing 47 as our example. We're doing 60 pounds per acre of barley. Okay, so the gear box is this one. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Yep. So depending on your seed type, it'll tell you which gearbox. So here's an example of alfalfa, hay, and barley. So we're doing 
Barley. Yep. So it'll tell you you want to be on the gear box too. So it's here. Okay. So then it says set the main box seed right handle sitting course check. Loosen wing nut under the handle. It's this guy over here. So we gotta go this is the actual seed rate. Oh, that's your seed rate adjustment right there. Yep, so the way you can tell if you want 60 pounds per acre of barley, right? You look at 60. Well, it's set on 45 right now. And if you go on drive type 2, it's telling you seeding rate at pounds per acre. So if you want yep, 60, then you actually put it in 79. Going? So what you need to do is move indicator to about 10 higher than desired from the seed rate chart. And then back. Right? You go over 10 and then back. Oh. Huh. Okay. So then you engage the lockout hub and seed away. Something you don't want to forget. You got to just pull this out and then turn. That is what's releasing the seed. This is what actually is making it wheel driven now. Oh, I see. Otherwise, it's for it's transport. It, so, it, ENG yeah, for engaged. So, now it's engaged. Yeah. It's going to drive the mechanism. Exactly. Okay. So, the way to get up to the boxes is to put the cleat. So, then you fill your seed. Why are there two boxes? So for different sizes. You can have two different sizes. Yes. So, I use the one in the back where it says native grass on it. Because we were seeding with grass. If you're doing corn or something you would use the front box. Yeah, and it'll tell you in the manual. Hmm. So it's got little wheels in here and there's actually a fill. Where's the indicator that you can glance back? Oh, right here. It's up here in yeah, the front. that's right. right tell there. you if you're getting low Empty or not. Pull. Yeah. And then when you clean this out before you're pick up with Jennings, you definitely do not w use water on this thing. Just you gotta, blower? Yeah, use a blower. We just use a shop bath. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so then when it's... For the winter time, these guys are pulled out, so they, they put these back together. So basically how this thing works is the discs are cutting slits, mm -hmm. and then the, the tubes are dropping your seed in, and then the press wheels are pressing the soil back together. So, two really critical things to remember are don't back up, because then your discs are going to get clogged with dirt, and you're going to have to get down there with a hmm. screwdriver and dig it out. I've heard people say that. And you've got to pull it out of the ground when you make Turn. turns. So, you can do like... the hydraulic mechanism... Yeah, pull it up. You can do gradual, real gradual, but I just wouldn't. So we always just kind of like you're mowing hay. We just back and forth with it, and just pick it up at the end. Right. What's cool is it'll it'll stop dropping seed when you pick it up. Yep. When you pick it up. What? When you're done, set the seed cup doors to one, and that'll help clean everything out. Okay. And I think they recommend is it like a 50 horsepower tractor? At least a 40. 40. I got a 53 horsepower. You're good. I got my hydraulics are up front. So. Right, that's what the extra okay. houses are for to get you up there. Okay. So guys that are putting in big fields of corn and uh, sunflowers, they're using something like this. Oh, yeah, the big one yeah, right in. So, the way to check your seed, which I did when I first used.
what those are all for. It does a nice job. There's no doubt this wrap was a little small, so it made it a little harder. Oh man, it flies right through. Yeah, it did. Yeah, we got down to the ferns. And I had seeded this field last year also because this was just worse than the field we had up there. You can see it now. That's beautiful. Okay. What is that? Six feet tall? Yeah, six feet. Mark in the wood. So I think it's eight with the wheel. We thought about, originally our plan was to put it on a trailer, but, you know, who's going to be able to get it up and down off of there? Mm -hmm. Any transport to the truck. Mm -hmm. That's right. Flies on the highway. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. You Thank bet. You Thanks for showing us. You bet. <laughs>